this is our webinar, The Media Thesis and Modern Sinophobia. Um, welcome to our panelists, Midori, Andrew, Georgia. We're also joined by John Price of Canada China Focus. Uh, welcome, John. Hello to our live audience. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with our panelists today. Um, such a timely and important conversation. Uh, we're here with Andrew Mitrovka, uh, Georgia Kelly, uh, Professor Midori Ogasawara. We also have Canada China Focus's representative, uh, Professor John Price with us. And, uh, and it's great to see you all joining in, in such good numbers uh, from home. So I'm Bianca um, Jenny, and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute who are the co-organizers of this event. Um, and uh, I'm talking to you from uh, Montreal or Jojage, which is on the Ganyangehaga uh, territory. And um, I wanna thank our co-host, Canada China Focus, um, for helping to put this event together, as well as our media sponsor, rabble.ca, who've been helping us to get the word out um, about uh, this important event. So please do find out more about their work, Canada China Focus, rabble.ca, as well as the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. So after hearing from our panelists, we are gonna have um, uh, a Q&A. Um, so please do put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can time permitting. The chat's open. I can already see a bunch of you uh, have said hi, that's great. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Hi, Laura, Yuri, Elizabeth, great to hear from you. Um, it perhaps goes without saying, but please do keep your comments civil, free from harmful commentary, and wherever possible relevant to the topic at hand. So today's event, um, the media thesis and modern sinophobia. Um, I mean, even just looking at today's paper, um, it becomes evident how critical it is to be having these conversations. And with its close ties to US counterparts, uh, CSIS and Canada's other intelligence agencies, um, we've been seeing, we've been witnessing relentless hype around the threat of Chinese interference in Canada. And it's impossible not to be reminded of Cold War scaremongering or the hysteria that was directed at Muslim communities at the height of the US led war on terror. And this foreign interference panic um, that we're seeing obscures Ottawa's willingness to support um, the US's bid to contain China's rise. And there are glaring details that are left out of the narrative, um, such as the reality that three Canadian warships recently traveled halfway across the world following the US and stoking tensions in the Taiwan Strait and South China Sea. Why aren't these, why isn't this being talked about? Um, and it's Chinese Canadians, as we'll be talking about today, who have too often um, endured the consequences and been recipients of the harm uh, amidst this geopolitical situation competition. Um, and this is even extending to elite sectors such as um, Liberal MP Han Dong, for instance, or the Chinese uh, Canadian founders of Wealth One Bank. Um, and over the weekend, the Globe and Mail published a remarkable story about the national security conditions um, Christian Freeland recently placed on Wealth One, which is a bank focusing on Chinese Canadians. So what we're going to hear about tonight may get worse before it gets better. Um, it's hard to see uh, right now how short of, you know, some of the worst possible scenarios um, that, you know, it, it, it's feeling like there's little obvious end to the US-China geopolitical competition. But what is clear is that we must question and, st and stand up to the Sinophobia. So I'm now gonna hand it over to uh, John, Professor John Price um, from our co-hosting organization, Canada China Focus, to give us a few brief uh, words about uh, the work of CCF. Welcome, John. Thanks so much, uh, Bianca. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, it's been great to uh, work with uh, Bianca and the CFPI to put together this webinar and to have this uh, ever increasing important uh, conversation uh, and to be joined by three talented uh, journalists, Andrew, Georgia and Midori. Uh, my name is John Price. I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples in Vancouver. Uh, I've been on the board of Canada China Focus uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and a quick word about Canada China Focus for those that don't know us. We came together in November 2021, and our vision is to facilitate constructive public conversations that develop a better understanding of China and of Canada China relations. 
We want to engage both countries in advancing global decolonization, justice, and peace as essential elements of an independent Canadian foreign policy. So I hope you will uh, visit our um, website, uh, subscribe to our newsletter or contact us by email. I'm gonna post all that information in the chat as soon as I get off. Um, and I wanted to give a quick uh, word about an upcoming event this Saturday, September 9th from 10 to three Pacific time. We are helping to put on a special symposium, 1923 race empire and settler colonialism across the Pacific hosted by UBC and the University of Toronto. It brings together some of the top specialists from Canada and the US. It's free and I'll be putting the registration link in the chat for that as well. Um, today's uh, webinar is extremely timely, obviously, with the announcement of the new public inquiry. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, issue that, is, uh, as Bianca mentioned, is not going away. Uh, uh, Senator Yuan Pao Wu has also given the same message. Um, and it's important for us to understand what's going on here, how this is related uh, to racism, to Sinophobia, but how complex the issues are, because it's not simple. These are compl complicated issues. China as a country is a big country. It does uh, wield tremendous influence. Um, and we have to be able to take critical approaches to it as well as to what's going on in Canada. So that's our uh, challenge. And I'm really pleased to have uh, such great uh, uh, commentators tonight uh, to join us and to enlighten us. So um, thanks very much. And I look forward to the discussion. I'll put those information, uh, the information I mentioned into the chat now. Thanks so much, Bianca. Thank you. Thank you, John. And um, a huge thanks to you as well for your role in putting together this stellar panel of speakers. So the first panel of the evening, the first panelist of the evening is Andrew Mitrovica. Andrew is a writer and teacher. He spent a long time as an investigative reporter at various places in Canada, including CBC, uh, CTV, The Globe and Mail, and The Walrus Magazine. He wrote a groundbreaking book about Canada's spy services called Covert Entry, Spies, Lies, and Crimes Inside Canada's Secret Service. And he's been a columnist with Al Jazeera English for seven years. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Bianca. Um... I want to keep my remarks short because I think a lot of the uh, um, discussion uh, about these events uh, will flow from uh, questions from I, I, uh, our astute audience, and and I, I dearly want to hear from the other panelists as well um, uh, on their perspective of, of the events that we're uh, discussing today. But uh, let me begin with a. a, a somewhat facetiously, but cheekily, a, a fair warning. Um, having a, um, spent some time examining Canada security services, I suspect that uh, it's more than likely that an intrepid member of those security services may have infiltrated this webinar to monitor <laughs> what we are doing here to uh, pluck out any uh, potential uh, uh, disloyalty among the academics or media representatives present uh, to report back to their superiors. Uh, it's happened before, uh, and I'm sure uh, if you're in the audience, welcome. I hope you enjoy uh, today's uh, event. Um, I have to say that um, when I received the invitation from Mr. Price, uh, Professor Price, to appear, I was a little reluctant to say yes, because I had the uh, depressing displeasure of appearing before three House of Commons committees earlier this year that were examining Chinese interference. And, and at first I was at a loss uh, to why the, uh, they would come to me and invite me. And I asked, well, why do you want to speak to me? And they said, well, you've written this book and you, while you were at the Globe and Mail, you're reporting about uh, in campaigns way back in the night, late 1990s and 2000s, perspective is something that some men me would care. Um, in my concern that um, people were examining this, uh, as John pointed out, constitute 
through the Paredes were looking for a, a lever or leverage into the into the story that they could capitalize politically. And there was very little. Andrew, I just want to draw it, your attention to the fact that it's cutting out. Oh, I think we've lost Andrew. I'm just going to give him a few minutes to a few uh, moments to come back. Andrew, yeah, we lost you. Your 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 uh, yeah. connection seems a little unstable. I don't know if you're able to connect to- It's um, the communication yeah. security establishment. What can I say? <laughs> that seems a little bit better. Uh, that seems a little better. But if, uh, if uh, can, right. you might need to- you might need to tether, you know, might need to go on your cell phone or something, just heads up. All right. So in any event, uh, I appeared through three House of Commons committees, uh, but I was particularly struck how uh, national security infrastructure, uh, including uh, if, and I've written this, uh, Canada's uh, pretend uh, Socialist Party of Canada, uh, the NDP, uh, who, whose members, in effect, uh, with one notable exception, prostrated themselves in front of uh, two uh, spooks, one current spook at the, the CSC and the other a former spook uh, at CSIS, and, and treated them with uh, almost giddy deference. It was quite shocking. But the, the, the thing that epitomized uh, the, the really, the almost uh, obscene hysteria that has gripped uh, and that has been um, gripped the country and uh, that has been ginned up by uh, largely, um, and, and, and these are facts, I think, uh, white male reporters who are probably working in cahoots with uh, pedestrian white male members of Canada's security intelligence infrastructure um, uh, to cast uh, aspersions about the, the disloyalty uh, of uh, not only Canadians of Chinese descent, but a former uh, governor general of Canada who was appointed to that position by uh, the former prime minister of Canada, um, uh, Stephen Harper. Now, I want to, to read you an exchange between a conservative member of parliament and uh, a publisher who appeared uh, at one of the committees uh, of, um, it's kind of a third tier Samastad press of xenophobic tracks um, uh, who appeared um, and uh, and this was the exchange that I think epitomizes what we are here to discuss. So let me just bring that up, if I may. So uh, this is a conservative member of parliament who asked this question of this other panelist. Uh, now, this could have been any conservative member of parliament. The identity of the conservative member of parliament is irrelevant. Um, and this was his question. Based on his ties, and he's referring to the former Governor General of Canada, David Johnson, do you think that Mr. Johnson has been the subject of elite capture by, and I, I, in parentheses here, by the PRC? This is the panelist's response. I think Mr. Johnson, over his 40-year career, has had a positive predisposition to China and the PRC in the hopes that we could establish economic opportunities and gains for all Canadians, which I believe they fully subscribe to and believed. So in effect, the panelists is so... I'm telling you, it's the CSC. <laughs> we, can, we can hear you, we can hear you fine. Okay, all we right, so in effect, a sitting so-called member of parliament essentially accused the former governor general of Canada, our head of state, of being, quote unquote, an elite capture of the People's Republic of China. This is what this irresponsible uh, reporting uh, that has taken snippets of, of intelligence completely out of context to a fit, of, as Bianca pointed out, a particular narrative. This is the kind of ugly hysteria that is being ginned up uh, by, uh, regrettably, uh, the newspaper that I once worked for, a news organization that gladly I never worked for, 
and um, and 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 these are the, the human consequences and repercussions of of that kind of reporting. The other, the final point that I want to make is one of the aspects of this story that has not received the attention that I think it deserves is the role that academics have played, particularly in the Toronto Ontario, uh, Toronto Ottawa nexus. Um, and their relationships, their close relationships with the security intelligence infrastructure in Canada have in promoting the narrative that, that Canada is under siege and that our, our democracy uh, is in some kind of existential peril. Um, and of course, you see and read with one notable exception and surprising exception, um, uh, Wesley Walk at the University of Toronto, who um, uh, on his Substack, I, I think has written some, and I, I, anybody who understands my relationship with Professor Walk knows that we are not allies. Um, um, uh, he has written quite extensively about the inadequacies of the reporting um, that failed to take into a context um, a, a broader understanding of the national security of infrastructure in Canada. So I think, I, and I do want to spend some time on the academics in that Toronto Ottawa nexus who are fueling and feeding this hysterica under the under the under the imprimatur of the uh, post-secondary institutions that they work for, because then they lend a certain gravitas to these accusations that they do not uh, merit or warrant. Um, so just with that, I'll leave it at that. And, um, and, and, and those are some points that I, I just want to um, uh, further explore uh, as we continue our discussion on this important matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for, you know, despite the interference that we were seeing, um, you were able to give us such important background um, around this hysteria that we're seeing and also um, deep appreciation to you for being one of the few journalists actually holding our intelligence agency accountable um, for their actions and very important point too about the complicity of our academic institutions, which we rely upon. Um, and I look forward to hearing more from you later. Our next panelist uh, is Professor Midori Ogasawara. Midori is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Victoria. Her research focuses on the social consequences of surveillance uh, and technologies, including national security intelligence activities. Midori worked for Japan's national newspaper, the Asahi Shimbun, as an investigative journalist. In 2016, she interviewed the US National Security Agency whistleblower, Edward Snowden, and published two books that unveil the NSA's secret spying activities in Japan. Welcome, Midori. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great, great. Thank you, uh, uh, both of you, uh, the John and Bianca, for including me to this fascinating event. I am really thrilled to hear uh, what the other panelists are going to offer. I have just uh, the heard uh, the Andrew's talk, and then I will definitely respond to you later. Uh, I yeah, there are the, so many questions about this issue, but you already referred to the uh, inadequacy of the reporting uh, by the mainstream media on this issue in. Uh, here in Canada, and then that was uh, my uh, the first impression about the media campaign on this matter, uh, the China's interference to Canada, Canada's national election, which started in um, the, the February this year. So uh, let me start uh, my talk uh, with this the, the initial coverage by the Globe and Mail. Uh, the CSS documents uh, that revealed uh, the Chinese strategy to influence 2021 election. That was the you know initial uh, the story they started to the campaign, right? And then I'm like you, Bianca. I'm one of the uh, those people who are still subscribing the paper, the real paper newspaper. And then uh, then people in Canada they told me the Global Mail is the way to go because this is the national newspaper. 
And then I used to uh, work for the Asahi Shimbun, which is uh, uh, the new national newspaper in Japan. It's a kind of Asahi is taking the, um, you, at least, you know, used to take the similar stance to Global Mail, like a liberal, you know, more democratic, uh, progressive kind of the newspaper. I worked there for more than 10 years as an uh, investigative journalist. Uh, then uh, I became sociologist. Uh, so I have uh, a few different backgrounds to get involved with this issue. I have uh, many concerns and questions about that. But today, I mainly like to focus uh, on the, uh, the question of journalism. Um, the, the, my main question um, for today is, is intelligence agency reliable source for journalism? Uh, the journalists and the reporters, uh, how if they, I was in the same situation, if I was offered the CSS report or from any other intelligence agencies, how should we react to that? Uh, can we just, you know, use the, all the narratives or the, you know, reports, you know, words, uh, the directory to my, to our article, is that proper things to do? How can we do the fact check or the cross reference? Is it possible? So these are, I think, the the very important questions we cannot really skip uh, to assess uh, what uh, uh, the CSS as well as the other communities who, with which is closely working with the CSS throughout the campaign um, is trying to say and influence us uh, through the information. So, uh, so as a journalist, I have to say CSS is clearly a part of the government. And then when the journalists report about the government, government offer you uh, the certain type of information, uh, they like us to report, to spread the words to the public. We have to take the certain distance, right? Because the independent uh, journalist or the more the, the space to reflect if that information you are offered is true or not. Uh, so the first question is uh, um, uh, that should be not uh, though, though that information the government offered journalists should not be used, you know, just uh, uh, just a directory without uh, any your own involvement or the investigation about it. So there is definitely there is a need of the fact check and cross reference. That's how I was trained as a, as a journalist and reporters. Uh, you cannot just, you know, to use the government documents for your reporting uh, without thinking about it or investigating about it. And then uh, the CSS is not just a part of the, you know, the government, not the one department of the government. It's a, they cover the special area. And the CSS is consists of the uh, the police and RCMP and then the military officers. So those people, those are the area. Actually, one of the most uh, two of the most difficult uh, the area fields for the journalists to get in and then see things, you know, like physically. So then, definitely, you need the several sources and talk to. And then trying to get the, the data and the information as much as possible for the cross reference. But uh, especially the NSCSS is not either, you know, just the police or uh, the, uh, the military either. They are covering the area of the national security intelligence, which um, has, uh, has been enjoying the, the big amount of the secrecy in this country. Uh, after, I mean, even during the, the wartime, but mainly after. Uh, the World War II. So um, uh, the intelligence agency, uh, they have uh, extraordinary power to investigate, uh, uh, to, to follow, to track and trace uh, your uh, daily uh, things, daily movement, behavior, or what you talk to. And they are basically spy agency. I think everybody knows this. This is not secret. However, uh, this is the spy agencies um, use different means police or the, the military would use, um, which uh, is the surveillance power. And that's, you know, get involved. That involves uh, the, my area of research. Um, and then in this area, the surveillance, security, intelligence, uh, the field, uh, intelligence agencies often use the illegal means of uh, the collect collecting data. Um, and in case of police, if they use the illegal means of the collecting data, they cannot use that data in the open code as the evidence, right? They, can, they lose the, the power to use, uh, like a legal power to use that data uh, as the evidence. However, in case of the intelligence agencies, um, 
they don't have such a setting, you know, no open code, uh, no adversary, you know, uh, the check uh, with the same information. And so they can just keep going, uh, the uh, keep going, keep using the illegal means of the, uh, the collecting data. And then, um, and that data collection uh, tend to be uh, the from the one-sided point of view. Uh, it's just inevitable um, because the third party um, they cannot really check the facts if that is really happening or not, or the accuracy of the data or the uh, the the correction of the data, uh, which is more difficult in the field of the intelligence agency. So it's different from the criminal justice system or it's different from the police investigation. Uh, they have more uh, the freedom to, uh, to use the, the normally like a illegal, illegal means of the surveillance, which is the spying wire tapping or uh, the, 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 um, the using the uh, bugs uh, to hear your day-to-day -day conversation or um, do, yeah, it's just that they can uh, the break your uh, house, you know, without telling you. Uh, so they have other means uh, than the, the normal means that police would use. So then um, the, in, uh, the journalists uh, needed to be more careful uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the data offered by the intelligence agencies. If um, they wanna use that data, uh, definitely you have to go through the other routes to, to find out if that's the, um, that, is the, that is really happening or not. And then when I came to, uh, when I see this the original article, I was puzzled, actually. It looks like, you know, really um, scoop, you know, that's, that's expose by uh, Global Mail, maybe, you know, once in, uh, in decade. However, uh, I couldn't really see what is uh, really happening. I couldn't really see the narratives or the facts or what type of, uh, what type of interference has been done or uh, the how it is uh, like a real threat for the national security of Canada. Uh, until uh, the seventh paragraph. And in the se after the seventh paragraph, there are some, you know, the cases, um, the reporting share, but it's not, um, not even on the front page. And it goes to the, uh, the page 15. And then the, after the ninth paragraph, it's, there is uh, the China employed, it says the China employed the disinformation campaign and a proxy connected to Chinese Canadian organization in Vancouver and the GTA, which have a large mainland Chinese immigrant communities to voice opposition to the conservative and the favor the Trudeau liberals. The CSIS documents reveals that the Chinese diplomats and then their proxies, including some members of the Chinese language media, were in, um, instructed to press home that the Conservative Party was too critical of China and that if elected, it would follow the leading, the lead of the former uh, US President Donald Trump and then ban Chinese uh, students from certain universities or education programs. So uh, they tried to frame this part you know, as a disinformation campaign uh, by the Chinese government. But did they check if this that's the that this information? Because in the US that was already happening. The the less Chinese students are allowed to get the visa or the uh the study permit, you know, that's uh, that's really happening already, right? Like uh, uh and then some students trying to come to Canada instead. Uh, but as far as I heard uh the from my Chinese uh the colleagues on campus, uh those people are having a difficult time to get the visa or study permit too. So I question, you know, this framework, you know, the, the reporters uh, for in the, uh, the Global Mail, they have really checked that that was the disinformation or not. And then the, uh, the, uh, the article continues uh, and they even cite the comments uh, by the uh, Chinese consulate in general, I think. Uh, her comment, uh, this will threaten the future of the voters' children, children and it will limit their education opportunities. Um, the CSIS report quoted the Chinese consulate official as saying, and the official added, the Li uh, Liberal Party of Canada is becoming the only party that the PLC can support. So that was uh, the first case the article introduced. And uh, however, it doesn't tell how they get this data how CSIS 
get that comment, which was clearly the spoken within the inter, uh, uh, internal community or within the, the consulate. They don't really disclose, uh, and in spy agencies, they can't disclose. I mean, they don't want to disclose because they don't want to lose the source, uh, definitely. So uh, that is their priority. Uh, however, without the disclosing the means of the collection of data, that third party, no journalist cannot really um, check if that is the true or not. Um, so that's the, uh, the first things I wanted to address. Uh, but just as a reminder, uh, because in case of Canada, we have uh, uh, the Bill C-51, uh, which was passed in 2015. Now it's called the Anti-Terrorism Act. And this act uh, gave CSIS an extraordinary, extraordinary power to reduce the, this is the quote at the part of the law, the reduce extraordinary power to reduce the threat to Canada, uh, unquote, even if doing so violates the Canadian Charter of Rights and uh, Freedoms. So here we are after eight years, the CSIS got the extraordinary power and then they can use um, the illegal means of uh, data collection as a legal way to collect the, the data. And then now the Chinese communities and Chinese Canadian community are seeing the consequences. I leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dory, for sharing your analysis and your groundbreaking uh, research around surveillance um, and also for you know, pointing to this important question around the viability of government uh, run intelligence agencies as credible, sort of tenable sources of information as we explore, you know, media ethics um, in this, this, this discussion. I posted um, some of Midori's uh, recent articles, uh, including one uh, discussion uh, article which discusses how Canada's legislation has been legalizing previously illegal surveillance activities, um, as well as uh, an article written by Midori about how Canadians are being spied on by our own uh, security agency. So please do check, uh, check those articles out and follow Midori's important work and research. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker of the evening. Um, our next speaker is Georgia Kelly. Georgia is an assistant editor at rabble.ca and a section editor at the University of Toronto student newspaper, The Varsity. She likes to write about immigration and multiculturalism in Canada, as well as labor and housing issues. Welcome, Georgia. Uh, thank you so much, Bianca. Um, can you hear me okay? I, if you could speak up just a little bit. Sure, maybe I'll go like this. Okay, better? Yes. All right, great. Um, yeah, thank you, Bianca. And uh, also thank you to John for inviting me to the panel. Um, uh, I'll begin by maybe qualifying my comments a little bit. Um, unlike Andrew and Midori, I am very much at the beginning of my career, um, as is probably evident. Um, <laughs> but um, I did want to sort of speak from uh, my perspective as uh, someone who's just getting started as a journalist and sort of why and how um, I got to reporting about, um, you know, modern xenophobia in the first place. Um, and I'll begin by sort of echoing what um, you know, the other panelists have mentioned about um, sort of a weird um, a weird trend amongst, you know, uh, professors um, even at U of T uh, here in Toronto um, that I've had, as well as um, news outlets that, you know, otherwise seem to be pretty uh, meaningfully engaged with things like anti-racism and anti-imperialism. Um, when it comes to this topic of China and specifically Chinese interference in Canadian politics, um, there seems to be sort of like a lack of, of, of uh, you know, critical awareness of what's going on. Um, and I was sort of in that boat. Um, I remember classes I had um, in my first year of undergrad um, learning, you know, um, like hearing professors talk about Chinese interference, you know, in political science classes um, without any sort of, of, of nuance there. Um, so the reason that I actually um, was even able to be aware of what was going on in the first place because, was because um, I took a history class um, about um, uh, Chinese Canadians in Canada, and it was there that I, re I recognized the patterns, you know, um, there's Japanese internment in the Second World War, there's all kinds of, you know, ye yellow peril hysteria, we can like see it happening again and again over time over the past, um, you know, 100 years with um, Chinese immigrants and other Asian immigrants um, coming to Canada. So um, that was kind of 
that was kind of why I was able to sort of um, pick up on this in the first place. Um, and there's three sort of pieces I want to uh, talk about um, that I've written. One was um, Canada's uh, special travel restrictions um, related to COVID-19 back in January um, for people traveling from China. Uh, the second was um, a piece published a few months ago by the National Post about um, Olivia Chow and potential um, so-called pro-Beijing groups um, sort of helping her win. Um, and the last one was uh, Stephen Gilbo, the uh, federal environment minister, being criticized for um, going to China or going to Beijing um, this a couple weekends ago um, to, uh, to meet with uh, the environmental um, advisory board there. Um, uh, so I'll begin by uh, talking about sort of like a trend, trends that have happened um, that um, you can pick up in all three of these or that I did. Um, and the first one is that critics who were, you know, criticizing China or criticizing Canada um, would hold China up to like a much higher standard um, in comparison with other countries, um, starting with COVID-19. Um, you know, Canada implemented special restrictions. They required everyone flying in from China to um, have a COVID test. Um, and they cited, obviously, like health and safety concerns, which, I mean, sounds fair. Um, they mentioned the new variant, which is called XBB 1.5, which is a very catchy name. Um, uh, and it was also a variant that first emerged in New York um, in the US. Um, and of course, there was no travel restrictions on anyone coming from the US. Um, they also cited, you know, the Chinese government's sort of irresponsible response to the pandemic. Um, and as we all know, um, there were many other countries that also were very irresponsible um, when responding to the pandemic. Um, uh, with Stephen Gilbo, critics, um, mostly from the Federal Conservative Party, were saying um, that, uh, you know, A, China is guilty of human rights abuses, and B, China is guilty of, you know, abandoning a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. Um, and that is true, you know, China does emit the most um, carbon dioxide by country. Um, they're also the second most populated country in the world. Um, and if you break it down, you know, per capita, Canada is actually three times worse than China. Um, uh, another uh, trend I picked up on was that um, the policies that uh, Canada has implemented or that uh, critics were calling for uh, don't really make practical sense. I mean, um, the COVID policies that uh, Canada implemented back in January, um, there was absolutely no uh, science to back up that uh, those policies would actually mitigate the spread of COVID-19 or the new variant. Um, and why this? I mean, there's obviously public health experts that are able to tell the Canadian government this, um, but uh, you know the, the, the politics behind it um, seem pretty clear once you realize this. Um, uh, also, with Stephen Gilbo's trip to China to uh, work with the Environmental Advisory Board, um, you know, criticisms of uh, China being bad for uh, emitting carbon dioxide, I mean, isn't that like an all the more reason for Stephen Gilbo to go and work with their uh, Environmental Advisory Board? Um, uh, something else that um, I, I've seen over and over again um, with uh, official statements, um, as well as um, other media coverage of um, China and Chinese interference is a very overly broad use of the term Chinese. Um, you know, that could refer to a whole bunch of things. Um, there's the population of the country of China, and then there's the government of China. Those are two different things. Um, so when people refer to what China is doing or, or China's, you know, not doing good things here, um, you know, oftentimes that dis uh, distinction is sort of totally glossed over. And, you know, the average Joe just, you know, uh, who lives there is equated with, you know, uh, Xi Jinping. Um, uh, it also doesn't distinguish between people who have, you know, immigrated from uh, China to Canada within their lifetimes and, um, moreover, if they've come from Hong Kong, if they've come from uh, mainland China, um, Taiwan, where else? Um, and also people who were born in Canada um, to uh, immigrant parents who are basically, you know, categorized as Chinese because uh, their facial features and the sound of their last name, pretty much. Um, one example is the, uh, the mayor of Vancouver, uh, Ken Sim. Um, was born in Canada to uh, parents who immigrated from Hong Kong um, and was one of the politicians sort of accused of receiving help from uh, China or at least pro-Beijing groups um, in his mayoral uh, election and was just, you know, referred to as, as Chinese. And 
um, people pointed out that he had a cousin um, who was a politician in China. And it's like, yeah, I mean, his parents immigrated from there. Is that really, um, you know, such a surprise? Um, uh, as for um, people like me who are, um, you know, students and writing on um, China, Chinese interference, whether it's, you know, for, for, for journalism for, or for, uh, you know, academia or whatever, um, there's a few sort of strategies I would recommend when it comes to sort of reviewing other literature, other news coverage of um, this topic. Um, one is just to have sort of like a automatic, like, suspicion is the wrong word, but um, an awareness of any coverage that criticizes China or Canada's engagement with China, you know, paying attention to what assumptions they make um, and how they're using the term Chinese and how um, they are framing, you know, suspicion. Um, don't take connections with China, with air quotes, connections with China as automatic proof of acting as an agent of uh, the People's Republic of China, the government. Um, you know, um, people who are just ordinary citizens um, who've immigrated from China will naturally have family connections, they'll naturally have business connections. Um, people in their family uh, might be politicians, they might, you know, um, be part of organizations with China. And for that reason, they might have connections. And that's true of everyone who immigrates anywhere. Um, it doesn't mean that the, you know, foreign interference, again in air quotes, um, is, is involved. I would also advise people um, who, you know, like myself, who consider themselves probably to lean towards left, um, don't uh, assume that just because, you know, a, a source of media um, also tends to lean left and also tends to be um, aware of racism and, you know, uh, even very meaningfully so that they are going to be um, speaking from a place of authority and a place of like, you know, critical awareness when they talk about China and Chinese interference. Um, because I feel like we're still sort of playing catch up in that area. Um, uh, and finally, I would advise anyone writing about this to be as specific as they can when it comes to language use. Um, you know, um, when you say that somebody is Chinese or that an organization is Chinese, um, you know, what does that mean? Um, does it mean that um, it's founded by people who happen to have Asian features? Does it mean that it's like formally affiliated with the People's Republic of China? Um, is it a resource for people who have immigrated to Canada from China? Uh, because of the roles, those are all different things um, and homogenizing them all is, is uh, really dangerous. Um, yeah, I think that's my time. Well, thank you so much, Georgia. Loving, loving all those hearts that are coming up on the screen. Um, thanks for sharing your journey with us as well, um, in terms of how you got into this work and um, and your writing, and just the important work that you're doing to highlight this modern uh, science phobia. It's a great concern um, to to see the reluctance um, to address this form of racism, xenophobia in acad in academia and elsewhere. Um, and it's good to hear some of these trends as well, the broad and often inaccurate categorizations, um, as well as the, I was really struck by the climate hypocrisy um, and the failure to take into account, uh, you know, emissions, uh, per capita emissions, not to mention uh, climate debt over the years. Um, and this is urgent need to um, cooperate to overcome uh, these global crises. So. Um, and I want to, uh, you know, sort of echo what you're saying around the importance of staying critical, um, even when reading traditionally, quote, uh, unquote, uh, left media. So thanks uh, to uh, our panelists for their excellent introductory remarks. Thank you, Midori, Andrew, Georgia. Uh, thank you, John, as well, for, uh, for your introduction. We're now moving on to discussion portion of our evening. Um, please do continue to put your questions in the Q&A box. We'll get to them after uh, this brief discussion amongst the panelists. I'm going to invite um, Andrew to share any reflections that you have from the evening so far. Oh, you're on mute. Um, I think Midori raised an interesting and, and important point about um, how uh, journalists apply the discipline of verification uh, when they're um, getting uh, secret stuff from uh, sources uh, inside government. Um, and this is obviously something that I had a lot of experience uh, with, uh, both in my 
time at the Globe and Mail and other uh, news organizations, and particularly in the context of my uh, book about CSIS. Um, and I think uh, it, 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 how it's difficult to say, of course, without interviewing the reporters and the editors who were involved uh, both on the television side and on the newspaper side uh, to, um, to determine precisely what the process was uh, in terms of uh, um, the verification process to put into some broader context the information that was being uh, uh, provided to, to reporters. I can only tell you from my experience at the Globe and Mail that uh, there was a heavy reliance on the reporters, okay? Uh, that the relationship between the editors and the reporters was, was that there was almost absolute faith in what the reporters uh, were, were producing. Uh, I think, and this is a broader criticism of, of I think, and a legitimate criticism, because I confronted it myself, oftentimes editors uh, knew nothing about the security intelligence infrastructure in Canada. They had knew, knew nothing about uh, uh, existing or, or uh, legislation. And Midori referred to Bill C-51, for example. Now, there might be some editorial writers who might be familiar with that legislation, but broadly speaking, uh, the frontline editors who are editing the work of reporters, and having been at the Globe and Mail, uh, I experienced this myself, there was a lot of faith placed in the expertise and the understanding that the reporters had in terms of their understanding of the significance of the information that was being provided to them. So uh, because there was a institutional wide absence of any expertise regarding these matters, and therefore there's a heavy reliance on the reporters and de facto a heavy reliance on the sources. Now, when I did my reporting, I did my reporting with another reporter, Jeff Sallett, uh, on these issues way back in 1999, in the early 2000s. And we were all, always challenging one another. We were always challenging one another. And we always demanded to see all of the documentation. And my reading of Wesley Walk's substack, uh, his dissection of the reporting, which I think is 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 an important source for us to consider this issue, this important issue of verification is that we demanded. So for example, I ultimately obtained a top secret document called Project Sidewinder. I got the whole thing, everything, not a snippet of it, not an excerpt of it, the whole thing. And then Jeff and I spent some time dissecting it, examining it, reading it carefully. And I can tell you, if we got that document today, my goodness, the play that it would have gotten uh, would have made these recent revelations picayune by comparison, okay? Because it was the entire document, okay? But this is the difference, I believe, in what happened then and what happened now. Now, I'm not presenting myself as an old fart here who's commenting on these other reporters. I'm just telling you my experience at the Globe and Mail. We had editors who I think at the time were a little bit more circumspect, who were who created a wall uh, and uh, between the institutions that were providing us with the information and the news organization itself. It seems to me that what is happening both on the television and on the newspaper side, particularly at the Globe and Mail, is that they have thrown their lot in completely with the intelligence services to the point that this is almost defending the intelligence services. So we had this extraordinary episode of the Globe and Mail publishing on its front page the, uh, the musings of one of their sources who was providing this exculpatory explanation for why he or she was providing the newspaper with the information. I can assure you that if I had been asked way back in 1999 to approach my sources inside CSIS to write 
self-aggrandizing pieces, legitimizing what they were doing in terms of leaking snippets of information, I would have said, what is happening to this newspaper, okay? What is happening to this newspaper? And so what is happening, I think, is that, that the globe in particular has thrown itself completely into the lot of the security intelligence to the point, I must say, that if you read the op-ed page of the Globe and Mail, has anyone read a dissenting column published by anyone in academia, anyone with any expertise in security intelligence raising any questions about the Globe and Mail's reporting? No, because it, and I have heard from an experienced columnist at the Globe and Mail who has told me that that would be a career limiting move to do in this environment. And so it's dangerous, it's dangerous. Journalists need to be challenging their information, challenging their sources, challenging the veracity. And what I fear is happening is both on the television and the newspaper side, that this umbilical cord exists between the sources and the reporters, and that umbilical cord is permanent. It's not going to be snipped away. Thank you, Andrew. Midori, what came up for you during the discussion? And, um, and also, if you have any thoughts on Andrew's, uh, the new points that Andrew has raised, love to hear uh, some of your reflections. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for the responding to my uh, my question. I was actually yeah really wondering how the journalists here, uh, they investigate about the intelligence agency, and then how you know what's their approach to that uh, the generous too generous offer, <laughs> because they don't normally intelligence agency they don't want to disclose the data, uh, and then this is very interesting because that can somehow like. Um, suggest uh, um, almost like a, yeah, the willingness, you know, the how much voluntarily the global mail wanted to work so closely with the, uh, with the, with CSIS. And then this is not the, you know, official disclosure of the information from the CSIS and it's through the uh, whistleblower, right? So-called whistleblower. No, but Majori, can I just jump in there? This construct <laughs> that this source is a whistleblower is a self-serving construct of the Globe and Mail. Whistleblowers, and Midori, you are familiar with this as an experienced investigative reporter who you interviewed uh, Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden stepped out of the shadows, okay? That's what whistleblowers do. Whistleblowers put a face and a name and they explain their actions, they explain their motivations, they explain the reasons behind their decision to disclose information that could put them in jail and affect their lives in really consequential ways. This person, and I can assure you, it's one or two or three people at the most, this person or persons, they are not whistleblowers. Whistleblowers come out of the shadows. And I wrote a piece in Al Jazeera and I challenged this person or persons to come out, come out from wherever you are to explain, to explain what you are doing, why you are doing it and how you're doing it, okay? Because that's important. So this construct that the Globe and Mail source, because it's to the benefit of the Globe and Mail to build a narrative that the individual who's, or individuals that are providing them with information is a whistleblower. Because in the in the in our profession, Midori and, and the other panelists, Georgia, whistleblowers are a godsend. They're saints. They are wonderful people with wonderful motivations, right? So that's yeah. why this construct, I challenge this construct that it's a whistleblower. Julian Assange is a whistleblower, stepped out of the shadows. Edward Snowden stepped out of the shadows and they met the consequences head on. I don't, yeah. I don't call people who hide behind their anonymity, right? And write self-serving editorials on the front page of the Globe and Mail, explaining their cockeyed rationalizations for leaking this information as whistleblowers. They are still anonymous, and from my experience, pedestrian intelligence officers who probably don't even speak the language 
of the, the country or countries that they are allegedly um, uh, 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 monitoring, okay? So, yeah. pardon me. I pardon can't me. agree more. Uh, I completely agree with you about the whistleblowing. And that's actually what I was going to say next, you know, like uh, because normally, the editors or the executives of the national newspaper, they are they they are more conservative than the reporters. So whatever the reporters you know bring the information, yes. uh, the information which have the possibility to, to shake uh, the government, uh, like a big shake, uh, they don't really yes. want to put that you know that type of the news uh, throughout the week. You know they may put that you know the expose one or two days. Uh, however, they stop it. And, and they don't want to create the even more political, you know, like um, um, the, the 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 crisis uh, for the government. But I have a and question that, for you, Victoria. Uh, that, that was the challenge in the case of the Snowden. So okay. then, and then also he did the really well, you know, the through the connecting the some independent journalist, uh, uh, the Rola Poitras and the uh, the Glenn Greenwald. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, the Snowden was exiled. And then, uh, as you said, the Julian Assange, uh, he was imprisoned. And yeah. uh, um, the Daniel, El Daniel Ellsberg as well, you know, he was, um, uh, he, in case uh, that he was, uh, he, he was eventually, he was, yes. free, he was freed. But um, anyway, so uh, I just like to remind uh, the audience, you know, the spying agency, their job, their task, is not only the spying, that's also the controlling the media and information and deceive, uh, deflect and then discredit, you know, some of the people who criticize government policies or trying to change the people's worldview. When they become influential, they yeah. mobilize all kinds okay. of means. Yeah. Can I, so speak, can I uh, speak to that so, point? Can I speak to yeah. that point? This is the interesting dynamic, okay? When I was doing my reporting back in 1999 with Jeff Salad uh, about uh, Chinese influence campaigns in Canada, we didn't pursue it as a scandal. We just reported what we what we learned. Uh, we reported it. Uh, there wasn't this institutional barrage. Um, it was a it was a sober, sedate um, exercise of. I believe sober and sedate reporting. At the time, guess who tried to discredit my reporting? CSIS. So fast forward two generations later, and you have this incredible, incredible um, um, spectacle of former CSIS officers appearing before House of Commons committees saying, with a straight face, calling for a public inquiry. It's, it's astounding. Calling for a public inquiry, demanding that the government release even more information. This is a security service that never releases information. If any of you mm -hmm. have filed a freedom of information request, it's astounding to me. And this is the other astounding aspect. As I was sitting there and listening to this and listening to these members of parliament bow before them with this, with deferring to this expertise, they actually said, both the, 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 the CSC representative, communication security establishment representative, and the former senior CSIS officer, that they were committed to openness and transparency. Oh. That is the point when I nearly burst out laughing and none of the members of parliament on any uh, of any political stripe said you've got to be kidding you have got to be kidding okay and so now what we have is we have a public inquiry so that's the sop and we were talking beforehand so they've appointed this justice uh, to head the inquiry the, I just want to tell the audience, she's not the important appointment. The important appointment is going to be commission counsel. Who do they appoint as commission counsel? Now, if they appoint someone as like Paul Cavaluso, who was commission counsel on the mayor Arar uh, travesty, which by the way, CSIS and the RCMP were largely responsible for, right? And one of the reporters who is spearheading the reporting 
of so-called Chinese interference in Canada maligned Mayorar as a 100% terrorist and has never apologized to Mr. Marar for that egregious falsehood. And yet he is continuing to report on security intelligence matters in this country. There's, then, a, there's a lot to be outraged about. There's a lot to be outraged about. I'd love to hear from Georgia as well um, on, uh, on all of this. I'd love to hear some of your reflections from the conversation earlier. And also anything in response to um, what Andrew and Midori have uh, have been discussing? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, to be honest, I haven't uh, myself dug too much into um, the CIS investigations. Um, I'm not an investigative reporter. And so, um, you know, journalistic standards in that regard are sort of um, unfamiliar to me. But I guess that's sort of further to, um, you know, Midori's point about um, you know, holding journalists to, um, you know, stronger fact-checking standards when it comes to talking about um, the CSIS um, uh, reports and the whistleblowing articles from the Global Mail um, in particular. Um, one thing that struck me actually just, you know, um, speaking more as like a lay person um, when um, the Global Mail uh, reports were coming out was that um, there's an article in the Toronto Star pointing out that, you um, you know, the CSIS has been incredibly wrong before and not too long ago. Um, I believe it was related to 9-11, although um, don't quote me on that. Um, and so, but at the same time, um, as, you know, Midori said um, in, in her own uh, talk, um, we sort of take the CIS, um, at least, you know, us who are not, um, you know, re uh, uh, regularly reporting on it, um, as you know, they're they're whatever they say as sort of God given truth, um, and um, so that's what I'll all say. Um, yeah. Can I just um, jump in on that point? Okay. Yeah, sure. In one of my appearances before the House of Commons Committee, I pointed out that former Inspector General of CSIS, Eva Plunkett, whose office was shuttered by a Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper, the now Conservative Party who is demanding accountability on these national security issues, Ms. Plunkett is in her final report, and I quoted extensively from it in my House of Commons testimony, found that there is an institutional wide, institutional wide uh, habit of getting it wrong, okay? And I can assure you having interviewed Scores of former intelligence officers who have worked throughout Canada's security intelligence infrastructure. And this is the interesting thing about the Global Mail so called information. A lot of it is open source. Okay, it's open source information. There's nothing particularly secretive about it. Okay, there's nothing particularly secretive about it. Project Sidewinder, for example, was the product of open source research. And that's why at the time, and it named companies and individuals that it, it claimed had been compromised. And here's another significant difference between the Global Mail today and the Global Mail back then. We made an editorial decision, notwithstanding the fact that individuals and companies were named in a top secret document. And this is the entire document. We did not feel it was responsible without independently verifying whether or not these people or institutions, public and private institutions had been quote unquote compromised by, by, by the PRC to name them. So what do we have today? We have a sitting member of parliament who has sued and quite rightly, a news organization for defaming him He's not the first Canadian of Chinese descent. Michael Chan, the former Ontario Liberal Cabinet Minister, has also filed suit, a defamatory libel suit. And it will be interesting to see how those libel suits are settled in the near future. And it will also be interesting to see how these reporters and news organizations respond to queries from the public inquiry itself. John, your thoughts? 
Thanks, uh, Bianca, and thanks for the panelists. It's been a great conversation. I would um, just come back to the question of, um, the, of reporters and how they uh, cover these stories. And, and we can see, like, it's quite incredible today uh, with the announcement of the public inquiry, uh, wh who were the first people that CBC went to? Uh, it was two former directors of CSIS. Richard and these, Padden, yes. Yeah, Padden and I forget the other guy's name. And, yes. these are, and these are the commentators. Well, what are you going to get from that? I mean, you know, they, the, you know it's, it's, there are never, uh, uh, they never go to surveillance experts. They always go back to people who are supposed experts on, uh, and often come out of CSIS. Like there's a guy by the name of um, uh, Michel Juno Katsia. Michel Juno wrote the foreword to my French language book of my yeah. book. Okay. Yeah. I, I was the first one, you know, for better or worse, that created Michel Juno Katsia's profile in the Canadian media. Right, John? So Richard Fadden, Richard Fadden, my goodness, Richard Fadden, to my way of thinking, all roads lead back to Richard Fadden on this score. All roads lead back to Richard Fadden on this score. And you're absolutely right. Who does the CBC go to? Richard Fadden. Do they interview you, Mike, uh, uh, John? No, because you're in Vancouver. You're out in BC. You're, you're in nowhere land. Right, as far as they're concerned, anybody out of that Toronto, uh, anybody out of that Toronto, Ottawa axis, whether in the in the media, in the in academia, or in the security intelligence infrastructure, it's an incestuous nest. Right, it's an incestuous nest. So what I would uh, I, I would add to this uh, is that. Despite the fact that the conventional mainstream media, including CBC uh, and uh, the Globe Mail uh, and others that we know, uh, continue in rather uh, unsavory ways of uh, dealing with this topic, um, I do think we've uh, turned a corner um, and that we are now seeing more critical perspectives. It's partially because I think they have overreached and overplayed the China threat to the point where it's become a bit, uh, it's become a bit craziness. We had, uh, when the Canada-China Focus Advisory Group uh, published their uh, open letter uh, regarding uh, a public inquiry, there is a strong response, both uh, uh, on the number of people who signed the open letter, uh, signed onto it, but also in terms of the media. Uh, there were some uh, breakthroughs in terms of uh, getting a different narrative out there. So I think we have to seize on those moments. And I think this is another one. And I want to congratulate uh, all of uh, the people on, on this webinar, uh, Andrew uh, through Al Jazeera uh, and Midori through her work on surveillance and Georgia through Rabble. Uh, we're getting more critical perspectives and, there is, and it is resonating and people are sort of like, you know, they realize that when you talk about foreign influence, you know, to not even discuss the United States influence in Canada, when you're talking about foreign influence, there's something wrong, right? I mean, whatever you may think about China or whatever, uh, you know, the overwhelming foreign influence of the United States is incredible. Um, and we also know that in, in terms of um, you know, the uh, US uh, interference in other countries, there's no country in the world with a worse record of foreign interests in other countries than the United States. But our government refuses to talk about that. Um, and so people are sort of cluing in, right? That there's something wonky going on here. So I think we've turned a corner and I congratulate you all for making such uh, important contributions in doing so. And so thank you uh, very much for, for all your work. Thank well, one, you, of the, one of the oh. interesting things uh, is in one of the columns I flicked at, um, Canada's not so surreptitious attempt uh, to uh, to install a puppet regime in Venezuela, so much to the point uh, to the point where our former foreign minister, who ironically was my editor, one of my senior editors at the Globe and Mail when I was there, Christian Freeland, uh, became Canada's foreign minister, and and stood next to that Alexis de Tocqueville like. 
uh, icon of uh, liberal democracy, Yair Bolsonaro, and try to engineer the overthrow of, um, uh, you know, of, 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 uh, of a Venezuelan government, which was, by the way, almost uniformly applauded by the Canadian media that is now uh, up in arms about uh, Chinese interference, which David Johnson in his report, it's as if nobody even read that report, because of course, Mr. Johnson, according to the Conservative Party, is a, a secret asset. This is how lunatic has become. It's a secret asset of the PRC, right? Where he found that the intelligence was taken out of context. Uh, there were only snippets of intelligence, that the accusation uh, relating, specific accusation relating to Ang Dong was completely and utterly false, right? But no, the, the, much, of, much of the media had was too vested in this to, uh, to stand back from it and sort of say, hey, did we screw up here again? You know? I'm gonna direct us uh, uh, a little bit outwardly towards our audience now because we have quite a few questions that they've posed and very little time left. Um, so I'm just gonna go do a, a dive into our Q&A. And the first question that I'm gonna take is from Laura who wants to know whether there's any actual space for debate on this issue in the mainstream media in Canada? Um, are there ever people offering contesting views on the China security narrative, on Canadian TV and news, editorial pieces, and newspapers, or in the mainstream magazines? What, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Georgia? Um, and I think that uh, as far as mainstream goes, you know, the outlets we've named so far, Global and Mail, CBC, um, Global News uh, is another one. Um, I think, uh, at least for the time being, it will be difficult to find. But um, that being said, there are a few other like more uh, alternative outlets I would like to shout out that are doing some really great coverage. One of them is The Breach. Um, one of them is Canada Land. There's Democracy Now. And of course, I have to shout out Rabble. Um, and the, all these outlets have in common is that they're fairly new um, and they're also very much um, you know, outside, uh, if you want to call it the establishment. And I think that's part of the reason why um, they have the capacity to, you know, take on this critical reporting is because they don't have those, um, you know, established networks or, or, or elite capture or whatever you want to call it um, that, um, you know, the more mainstream outlets have. So if you're looking for more coverage um, of this kind of content, I would point you to those outlets. I'm sure there's others, but those are the ones I can think of. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, for Andrew from Yuri, who wants to know whether we should be demanding the abolition of Canada's Secret Service. Um, I, I often, this is a question I often get about the efficacy of our in, intelligence service. And this is something that Midori alluded to in her statements that is something that we have to understand from a structural point of view about the existence of intelligence services. And this is what both Julian Assange and Edward Snowden revealed, is much of the apparatus of intelligence services that directed at domestic, at domestic uh, uh, population, right? And, and this was the significance of what both Julian Assange and particularly uh, Edward Snowden revealed, and that was the significance of his revelations, that this, that this, that these very uh, big, uh, expensive, um, powerful, legislatively powerful organizations, that they're training their eyes not so much on quote unquote our adversaries. They're doing that, however you define what the adversary is, but often they, often they're training. Uh, their, their, that apparatus on us, right? Uh, and, and of course, Midori knows that Canada is a member of, of, a, of a group of intelligence services called Five Eyes. So it's illegal, for example, for CSE, the Communication Security Establishment, to spy on Canadians. So what happens? We're in this partnership. Well, you've got the NSA, you've got GCHQ, you've even got New Zealand, for goodness sakes, and the Australians. So 
this is what Edward Snowden uh, revealed. The, the core significance of Snowden's revelations was that the entire apparatus of, of these intelligence services is often trained on us, right? And, and that's something that we have to grapple with because the oversight agencies over these intelligence services, both domestically and internationally, is woefully inadequate. And, and that leads to habitual congenital law breaking. And that's not my conclusion. It's the conclusion of the succession of federal court judges who have ruled that CSIS has broken the role repeatedly uh, in the context of their, uh, their work in Canada. All right. So, you know, the, the, that's a big question. It's a big question. And I don't think I'm, I'm capable, frankly, of answering it. OK, because it, it would it would take uh, it's a complex question. But that is all to say that we have to understand, as Midori pointed out, that, that these organizations often train their apparatus on us. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Owen has a question around um, the hysteria that we're seeing and whether this um, could be an intentional distraction from things like the war in Ukraine fighter jets that are being purchased, conditions at home, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love to hear from you, Midori, uh, about that. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Uh, like, uh, um, So I was in, in Japan last month, and then uh, the day I came back to Canada a couple of weeks ago, that was uh, August 24th, it was the day Japanese government uh, started to release the contaminated water, which was used to cool down the uh, the reactor is in Fukushima disaster. Uh, so Fukushima disaster, the nuclear power plant, you know, uh, explosion and meltdown happened in 2011. So actually not uh, many things, uh, the, uh, the cleanup since then. So the government eventually decided to release that huge amount, 1 million ton of the contaminated water, but all the Japanese media are now convinced to use the term of the treated water instead of contaminated water. Anyway, so the Japanese government, uh, despite the, the public opposition, uh, especially from the, the fishery, you know, the communities uh, in Fukushima, uh, they started to release the water to the Pacific. And uh, it's an international issue. And then Chinese government reacted to that, uh, the Japanese decision, the government's decision, uh, negatively, of course. And then they now talk about the, uh, the some bans of the trading, uh, the, the food uh, from Japan, um, so it became the really like an international issue. But on the day I arrived at home in Victoria, I saw this coverage um, on Global Mail, uh, which is uh, that China's work to sow doubts about Japan allies with the disinformation campaign against <laughs> nuclear water release. So this is, I hope we can see it. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so... Basically, the the global mail again is saying this is the this is the disinformation campaign by the Chinese government. So whoever <laughs> who criticized the Japanese government decision this time, that means you are on China's uh, under the influence of the Jap uh, Jap Chinese disinformation campaign, or you are just uh, on the the supporter of the, yes. the People's Republic of China. That's type that type of you know like uh, vast us uh, sorry the us versus them or the dichotomy, I mean, the binary. Um, it is, 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 has been growing about the war in uh, Ukraine or about the, uh, the any like, you know, climate crisis. Uh, it's just, you know, you are not, whoever, you know, uh, the say something critical to the, to the current, you know, the political situation, uh, that these people can be uh, the categorized as the, the enemy of the state. So yes. I think, you know, this is not only about the Chinese issue anymore. This can deflect our view from other important issues, uh, including the nuclear power uh, and or the plants or the climate crisis. And uh, so, yes, that's why I think this is very concerning. And then I was glad to hear uh, from John today that we have more critical voices within the Canadian society uh, because I... I was also late, you know, to become critical, to become really aware of this issue because I now know uh, my Chinese colleagues and friends and, and Chinese Canadian friends, you know, here, they've been discussing about this, you know, in ages already, like in the last few years at least, right? 
Um, so uh, I just uh, wanted to spread the, you know, this awareness uh, the farther outside the Chinese Canadian community. So I was uh, glad to be part of this, um, um, yeah, the event. And then definitely I will agree uh, the, with the, the person who raised this uh, important questions. Uh, um, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but definitely it's been working in that way to block have, our I, view. I have a slightly different perspective in answer to okay. this question. I think what is happening here to some extent, and I think that there is institutional cover for this, uh, um, even though CSIS uh, uh, brass are trying to distance themselves from uh, these quote unquote revelations, even though apparently according to David Johnson's, none of our elections have been influenced in one way or another. So the, the, the main thrust of this entire quote unquote scandal didn't happen, okay? Having said that, I think this is an effort to some extent to rehabilitate CSIS in, in, in the public consciousness in Canada. That you see our spies are doing their job and they're doing their job even in the face of this political blindness, right? That they are really the guardians of Canada's national security. And they are prepared to take these risks to defend Canada's national security. Now, this is, if anyone, and I wrote a book about Canada's security intelligence uh, uh, service. This is laughable, okay? This is laughable. The history of mistakes, the history of corruption, the history of nepotism inside Canada's Security Intelligence Service is rampant, okay? Mm -hmm. You had a group, you had a group of former CSIS officers file a multi-million dollar lawsuit alleging racism, corruption, nepotism, rampant inside the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. So I do think that there is some aspect that slightly different perspective of some aspect to try to rehabilitate CSIS's image in the public mind and among its political masses. One final point, the Pandora's box has been opened now. And this is why Trudeau and company were so resistant to uh, 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 calling for a public inquiry. Now this is emboldened every federal police officer, every intelligence officer inside of CSIS that wants for whatever parochial or personal reason to potentially provoke a public inquiry on a matter that they consider to be in Canada's national interest to leak information selectively to choice uh, reporters. The Pandora's box is wide open now. Thank you, Andrew. Sort of struggled to get myself off mute there. Um, we are coming pretty close to the end of our time. We do have a couple more questions. Um, I'm only going to be able to take a few of them. There is uh, an anonymous participant who uh, points out the hypocrisy of, um, of our parliament who are outraged by China interference, but aren't concerned with other interference, be it American or Israeli um, interference mm -hmm. or, or influence in Canada and the elections and wider policy. Um, to this, I would add, uh, Canadian interference in the affairs of other governments and Venezuela. And I think John had touched on this a little bit in, in his remarks. Um, wondering if, uh, if, if folks have any thoughts on this. Maybe I'll start with you, John, um, around this question of hip hypocrisy around interference and uh, when it matters and, and when it doesn't merit um, the outrage uh, of our media. Yeah, I think that the, um, you know, the the preoccupation of the media with this issue um, is, is, is fueled somewhat by sensationalism and also by a public appetite. Um, you know, we've gone through some important uh, periods here um, in which uh, the anti-Chinese racism uh, was so uh, virulent during the COVID crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the anti-Asian racism became, um, you know, so bad. And then we had the whole affair with um, the uh, detention of Meng Wanzhou and the propaganda that came out around that and the arrest of the two Michaels. These have created an atmosphere conducive 
um, and you know, to um, racist views uh, regarding uh, China and things Chinese. Um, and so that's the, you know, this is the, the atmosphere that, that's led to the situation we're in. Um, and so that atmosphere is one that's been created both through politicians and through uh, the media. Um, and so those very, you know, very, very difficult um, uh, situations have created a, a, a sort of a convergence of, of forces uh, that have made actually Canada an outlier. Uh, even amongst the five eyes, we are now sort of like going in so far in the in a radical direction in terms of our anti-Chinese uh, propaganda. I mean, take for instance the fact that the United States, right, who is really behind all of this because it perceives it losing control of the capitalist economy globally, um, you know, has sent four of its top people to China, right, uh, in the past six months, right. For Stephen Guibault to go to China, all of a sudden that's one person, right, to go to China, it's mm. outrage, right, yeah. on the part yes. of conservatives and others. So why, why are we such an outlier? This is an important question to me, right? Why have we become so radical anti-China uh, with now this public inquiry, et cetera? And I think there's an important discussion to be had uh, yes. about this. We have a number of things that are going on. We have... Um, uh, you know, the events in Hong Kong and Hong Kong expatriates who have become virulently anti-China. Understandably, they are outraged with what happened in uh, Hong Kong. Um, however, it's one thing to be outraged about what happened in Hong Kong. It's now, it's a different thing to say, project what happened in Hong Kong as an indication of a Chinese attempt to take over the world, including Canada. Second thing that's happening uh, as, as you get this is you, as, as Andrew mentioned, CSIS is trying to come back. There's no doubt about this at all. They're publicly, openly talking about how um, they are coming out of the, uh, out of the closet. They're becoming uh, active and publicly engaging. And so CSIS is really pushing on all sorts of buttons here to get things done. Um, so, and that's, um, you know, uh, uh, a second factor. The third factor is we have popular racism and popular uh, uh, ideas about China that have been within Canada for so long and given the circumstances over the past 10 years, <laughs> that has inflamed things. And so we're in the situation that's quite uh, extraordinary. Um, and I think that you know, it also helps to explain why the NDP has gone the way it has. The NDP, uh, we, we would never be in this position if the NDP had a, any critical faculty whatsoever. Lost, lost the, them completely. Uh, you know, the China-Canada committee that's been set up has become, uh, you know, uh, 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 an avenue of pro for propaganda. And unfortunately, there's a peak within the NDP that mm. is very much saying, the Hong Kong expatriate card and is very much uh, organizing to work with the conservatives and with the Bloc Québécois. And I just, um, I would just say that we shouldn't underestimate what's happening on the campuses. And this may be something to discuss in future because CSIS is now giving money to research security offices on campuses across the country to spy and to uh, spy on their own researchers and to get them to fill out assessment forms for their research. So we have a, an infiltration on the part of CSIS that has gone beyond anything that has ever happened before in this country. And so despite my previous comment that things are getting better because we're getting some critical perspectives, on the other hand, things are getting worse, especially in terms of what's happening in the, on the campuses. Could, could I just say something quickly? Let, let, let me just put it in an equation, okay? When we do it, it's fine. When bad actors do it, it's bad. Okay. Let me go to the point, another point that 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 John just raised about the role of the NDP in losing completely its critical faculties. So an NDP MP and a liberal MP and a conservative MP were apparently targets, coordinated targets of, of uh Chinese uh harassment but they were unaware that they were targets of Chinese harassment. So if you're a target of harassment and you're not aware that the harassment is taking place, how effective was the harassment? 
I mean, this is this is the lunatic territory that we are, are, are entering into and that the NDP, as John has rightly said, lost its critical thinking faculties to the point where I watched NDP members of parliament genuflect in front of uh, serving uh, spooks in Canada was a sight. And I used to work many, many years ago for the foreign affairs critic of the NDP, Pauline Jewett. And I can assure you, if Pauline Jewett had been sitting on that committee and those spooks had tried to shovel you know what in Pauline's face, she would have called them on it because she was too bright, she was too sophisticated, and she was too knowledgeable to allow that uh, circus to unfold. And uh, the, the NDP has just completely lost it. That is why I have written repeatedly that the NDP is the pretend Socialist Party of Canada. And on this, on this, this issue, completely, utterly lost its critical faculties. It's terrible to see. And on that note, I want to pose um, one final question to, well, to all of you um, in turn, which is what should uh, the media um, be doing to serve as a check on government, on, on CSIS, right? Um, what should they be doing to hold um, our intelligence agencies accountable and also to address this new wave of aggressive xenophobia that we are seeing? What, what is the role of media in all of this? Uh, Midori. Wow, yes, yeah, that's a, that's a big question and a very important question. Thank you. Uh, I definitely, uh, the media needs to establish the ethical, you know, the standards to, uh, to, I mean, they are not supposed to work with the government, basically, if that's the, if they, they the journalists want to um, have to keep the credibility, you know, the, uh, the, from the public. So um, the, they need to reestablish uh, the ethical, uh, the standards of their reporting. And then in that time, uh, there are already two important uh, things, you know, which have been, you know, pointed out uh, repeatedly. One is a transparency, right? The, there is always a transparency question about the, the uh, intelligence agency, what about what they are doing, and then in, especially in case uh, if they use the illegal means of uh, surveillance, illegal means of the collecting data. And then can you use that data, you know, without uh, the critically assessing that information? That's uh, the one thing media needs to go through. And the other one is the, the close to the, the transparency, accountability, then why they needed to do that. And then what's the, uh, the is that only the intelligence agency, which can, it can be entitled to define what the national security today. As what we all know, uh, the, uh, the, what happened to the Muslim community in this country, and then also the South in the border under the war on terror. Um, they were seen as the national security, and then the, there are so many, you know, new surveillance system the set up at the airport or street corner, and but and then they pre, uh, the government trying to present them that's for everyone's security. We are all in this together. However, it didn't really protect the Muslim community. They felt even threatened. And then in that case, um, what's national security? That's the that's the next question. Um, and so that brings me um, to the new question, actually the question of colonialism as uh, both Georgia and then John refer to. Uh, I think, you know, how can we decolonize the intelligence agency? Is that possible? Uh, it all, quite often it's referred, you know, as uh, the old voice club, right? Mm. Uh, as Andrew said, you know, that's, a, that's a really homogenized uh, the community. Yeah. And then just like to the, draw your attention uh, to end my talk, uh, my portion, uh, this is the book, uh, The Agent of Change, which was uh, written by the former CSIS investigator, Fuda McBeal. This was published this summer by the McGill, uh, the, uh, McGill uh, Queen's University Press. And she worked for CSIS as a Muslim woman uh, after 9-11. And you can imagine how much uh, the how discriminatory the treatment she was she needed to face. Yes. Uh, so she eventually quit the CSS and then she sued the CSS um, 
uh, anyway, uh, she wrote this book, and then um, I'm actually I'm excited to have her on UV campus uh, this fall. So I'm going to run the event, uh, the talk event by her, and but through that you know internal view, um, you can see externally how then externally to see this uh, the uh, define the threat and then the CSS, uh, the choose the targets. Um, so that's uh, something, you know, the media has to think about uh, from here, because we see the uh, extra, extremely negative consequences of the surveillance, illegal surveillance under the war on terror against the Muslim community. We don't want to see the same thing, the same repetition against the Chinese Canadian community or Chinese community here in this country. Uh, and then if the media want to don't want to be part of that in, institution, um, they need to reestablish the ethical standard of the uh, reporting, uh, independent reporting. Thank you, Midori. Thank you. John, thank you. John. I'll I'll leave it at that. I I'll, uh, I'll leave it to other speakers. I think we we're we're getting close to the end of our session. So uh, I know perhaps Georgia hasn't had much of a chance to speak. So if she wants to, or I'll leave it to you. Uh, yes, yeah. go ahead, Georgia. Sure. Yeah. Um, what I'll say is that I think um, the media um, should really pay attention to uh, providing context. Um, what um, in any sort of issue related to you know China and Chinese interference, um, uh, and really take sort of a proactive approach to um, you know dispelling uh, fear mongering um, and and xenophobic sentiments. Um, which and, and what I'll say also is I know that sort of might go against you know a traditional view of you know quote unquote objective journalism, but I think um, that um, and you know in this case. Um, not taking a proactive approach and not, you know, have automatically sort of um, being extra aware of xenophobia um, and racism um, when it comes to um, these kinds of stories um, means that, you know, stories are, you know, in the end, um, end up um, sort of furthering racist and maybe, um, you know, inaccurate narratives. Um, so yeah, um, being proactive rather than sort of re reactive to what, you um, uh, what, uh, you know, headlines we see and what, what developments happen. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, Andrew, any final comments before we wrap up? First, uh, I urge reporters to stop talking to Richard Fadden, okay? Maybe start talking to John Price. Um, also, uh, there's an inherent hypocrisy is still in... Uh, and it's part of the reason why I work for Al Jazeera English, which is a truly diversified news organization, an international news organization uh, with diversified for, uh, voices, um, a mosaic of voices. You just look at the opinion page of Al Jazeera English and, 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 and my point is proven. The Canadian media still, despite the strides that it has made, is still largely an old boys club, just like uh, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. So there's a kind of socialization that goes on, uh, explicit and implicit. There are shared values, shared understandings, shared motivations. And until uh, the Canadian media is truly diversified, truly diversified, uh, you're going to continue to see the vilification of minorities in Canada uh, by the old boys club, however it is manifests itself. And, and that is sadly still a reality that, um, and, and there are casualties, and I've said this, that this whole faux scandal is Mayora 2.0. And that's what it is. And I, I mark my words, when the commissioner, the, the head of the inquiry issues her report, interim report in February, about the same time that David Johnson had to complete his interim report, she will come essentially to the same conclusions that all of this was overblown, taken out of context, and the human casualties of that uh, linger. And that's the last point that I will make. 
Very, very important note to end on. And that is all that we have time for today. Uh, I wish we had more journalists in Canada like uh, the ones that we have on our panel today. Um, as audience members have been pointing out throughout um, the event in the chat, it's been a totally informative, critically important and incredibly engaging panel. I personally have learned a lot. I wanna thank you panelists for your excellent uh, presentations, responses, uh, analysis. I wanna thank you, John, for your organizational work today. Um, I wanna thank our audience for their participation, uh, presence and questions. And finally, I wanna thank uh, Canada China Focus um, for their great work. It's an important organization, find out more about them, as well as our media sponsor, rabble.ca, Rabble Media, we love you. I wanna encourage everyone to stay informed and stay engaged. Uh, and that's it for our program today. Good evening, everyone. Goodbye. Thank Take you. care. Bye.